Hello and welcome. This is Jill Gittins presenting episode two of the Homeopathic Compendium podcast series. The aim of these podcasts is to offer interesting topics based on David Little's work, The Homeopathic Compendium. First, I'd like to hand you over to another member of our team, David Gittins. Thanks, Mom. Hi, I am David Jr. I am David Little's eldest son. I run the office correspondence and PR. I am also the publisher of the compendium. Visit our website at friendsofhealth.com to download six free chapters, 318 pages. The Homeopathic Compendium by David Little offers an extensive study of classical and modern approaches to homeopathy, which provides an excellent foundation for medical practice. The compendium is a collection of six volumes, 4,500 pages, that are available for purchase as a box set or an ebook on our website. Visit similimum.com for a large collection of free articles and educational materials by David Little. Like us on Facebook at H Compendium to get updates, discount coupons, and of course to make the Little family happy. If you have any questions or feedback, email us at sales at friendsofhealth.com. Thank you for being with us today. Now I hand you back to our Reader-in-Chief, Jill. Compendium Talks, Episode 2. The Four Stages of Case Taking. The section I'm reading today is from Volume 2 of the Compendium, Repertory and Case Management. This volume explains all the aspects of clinical practice, including instructions for case taking, using the repertory and materia medica to find suitable remedies, and managing the case. The basis for successful homeopathic treatment is a well-taken case history. This episode contains some valuable advice and useful hints that will help you conduct a productive and helpful interview with your patients. We're reading from Volume 2, Chapter 2, Case Taking in the Organon. You can download the complete chapter free on our website. Now, let's open the book and begin. Filling in the details. The first stage of case taking. Hanneman once said there are no diseases, only sick persons. This view prevents the prescriber from becoming attached to fixed names and states rather than observing the individual and collective signs, coincidental befallments and symptoms. Hanneman's mark of genius is demonstrated in his balanced view of the patient and the disease. In Aphorism 83 he wrote, This individualizing examination of a disease case for which I am giving only general instructions here, and from which the disease examiner should retain only what is applicable to each single case, demands nothing of the medical art practitioner except freedom from bias and healthy senses, attention while observing, and fidelity in recording the image of the disease. The first task of a homeopath is to record the true image of the disease, not just the names of advanced pathological states. A practitioner should cultivate freedom from prejudices, sound senses and fidelity in tracing the gestalt of the disease. It is often said that a homeopath should let the client tell their story without interruptions. This is only part of the account. Hanneman actually divided case taking into four stages. The four phases are listening to the patient without interruption, asking general questions, asking precise questions and recording one's own observations. To successfully record the image of the disease, the homeopath must view the condition through the symptoms of the patient, information collected from relations and neighbors, and personal observation. In Aphorism 84, Hanneman wrote, the patient complains of the process of his ailments. The patient's relations tell what he has complained of, his behavior, and what they have perceived about him. The physician sees, hears, and notices through the remaining senses what is altered or unusual about the patient. He writes everything down with the very same expressions used by the patient and his relations. The physician keeps silent, allowing them to say all they have to say without interruption unless they stray off to side issues. Only let the physician admonish them to speak slowly right at the outset, so that in writing down what is necessary, he can follow the speaker. 
In homeopathy, the prescriber writes down the patient's details using the very same expressions used by the patient and his or her relations. Unlike the allopaths, they do not translate the words of the patient into the pathological titles found in medical textbooks. At this time, the practitioner keeps silent so they can record the process without interrupting the natural flow of the information. The practitioner only interrupts the patient if they stray off the subject at hand. The observer notes the nature of the patient's responses and any interaction with those present in the room. Most patients have a limited view of their situation, especially when it comes to how other people see them. It is very important to get the wife, children, relations or friends in a separate room so they can speak freely about the patient. The statements, however, must be vetted for their accuracy, as relatives and friends may have their own prejudices. The homeopath seeks to know much more about their patient and their lifestyle than an orthodox practitioner. The homeopath lets the patients do the talking, rather than expecting them to be passive recipients of the physician's opinions. The homeopath is trained to speak to the patient in simple language, unlike the orthodox medical experts. There is no need to attempt to mystify the laity by using the latest pseudo-medical terms, which are usually here today and gone tomorrow. In the footnote to Aphorism 84, Hahnemann again reminds us not to interrupt the patient because they will not repeat their statements again in precisely the same manner. The symptoms that are spontaneously volunteered are often the most valuable, as they are not coloured by the framing of questions. Hahnemann continues in Aphorism 85, the physician begins a fresh line with every new symptom or circumstance mentioned by the patient or relations, so the symptoms are all ranged separately, one below the other. The physician can add to any one that is initially stated all too indefinitely, but afterwards more clearly. The second stage of case taking. Each symptom and circumstance should be written on a separate line so that there is room to add additional information later. It is useful to leave a few blank lines below each of the most important symptoms so that there is ample space for more details. After the patient has completed what they have to say on their own accord, the homeopath then returns to each symptom separately and elicits more information. Now the homeopath begins the second phase of case taking where they seek further clarification of the symptoms given by the patient, relations and other witnesses. In Aphorism 86, Hahnemann wrote, When the narrator has finished what he wanted to say of his own accord, the physician enters a closer determination of each particular symptom in the following way. He reads through the single symptoms reported to him and asks for further particulars about this or that one. For example, 1. At what time did this befallment take place? Did the befallment occur before the medicine was used, while taking the medicine, or only some days after setting it aside? 3. What kind of pain, what sensation, described exactly, took place at this spot? 4. What exact spot was it? 5. Did the pain ensue in fits and starts at different times? Or was it persistent, incessant? 6. How long did the pain last? 7. At what time of day or night and in what position was the pain the worst? At what time and in what position did it stop entirely? 8. Described in clear, plain words, how was the befallment or circumstance exactly constituted? In this manner, the healing artist makes a closer examination of each single statement without putting words into the patient's mouth or asking questions that can be answered by a simple yes or no. A homeopath avoids leading the patient because this will produce a false picture of the disease state. In Aphorism 87, Hahnemann wrote, For example, the physician should not ask, Wasn't this or that circumstance also present, perhaps? The physician should never be guilty of seducing the patient into giving false answers and making false statements with any leading questions or suggestions. 
If nothing about various specifics is mentioned in the patient's voluntary statements, the prescriber should ask about the parts, functions and emotional state of the patient in general expressions so that the patient responds with the specifics. In this phase, the founder asks questions like how are the emotions, the temper, the mental powers, and how is the appetite, the thirst? The third stage of case taking. After the patient has related the relevant information under general questioning, the prescriber then asks more precise and specific questions. In this way, the practitioner moves from voluntary statements to general questioning to specific inquiries into areas of the case that need clarification. In Aphorism 89, Hanneman wrote, Only after the patient has finished freely relating the pertinent information upon simply being invited to do so, and upon being prompted with general questions, thereby providing a fairly complete image of the disease, is it allowable and indeed necessary for the physician to ask more precise and specific questions if he feels he has not yet been fully informed. If the homeopath needs to make inquiries into a specific area, they must provide the patient with a series of options rather than asking direct questions. Hanneman gives examples of this type of specific questioning in the footnote to aphorism 89. Point 7. What occasions the ailment? Does it come on while sitting, lying, standing or with movement? Only on an empty stomach, or at least early in the morning? Only in the evening, or after a meal? Or when does it usually occur? A complete symptom needs a location, a sensation, modification and concomitance. During the third stage of taking a case, the practitioner seeks to fill out any symptoms that are not complete by looking exactly into the nature of the locations and extensions, sensations and complaints, modalities and times, and any concomitants the patient may think of by association with the main complaints under review. They must also look into the circumstances that surround the symptom and search for any possible originating or maintaining causes. In aphorisms 86 to 94 of the Organon, Hanneman offers several examples of the types of questions that a homeopath should ask. Out of the account received from the patient and others, the most emphasis should be placed on the patient's own account of the disease, except in those persons who have proved to be undependable. The fourth stage of case taking. The fourth stage of case taking involves the observations of the practitioner. These observations include anything that is noticed about the patient's constitution temperament, character of the intellect and emotional disposition, mood, hair and eye colour, complexion, vitality, movements, positions, gestures, preferences in environment, as well as all the information gleaned from the physical examination of the patient. Hanneman gives the following examples in the footnote to aphorism 90. Point 1. How does the patient gesticulate during the visit? 2. Is he vexed, quarrelsome, hasty, inclined to weep, anxious, despairing or sad? Or is he comforted, calm, etc.? 3. Is he drowsy or generally dull-witted? 4. Does he speak in a demanding manner, very faintly, inappropriately or in any other way? 5. How is the colour of his face and eyes, and the colour of his skin in general? 6. How is the vivacity and energy of his expression and eyes? The symptoms of the homeopathic anamnesis are elicited by a careful psychological and physical assessment. The physical examination is an integral part of the homeopathic interview. Some consultants have left this part out of their case taking. Yet in the footnote to Aphorism 90, the founder speaks of collecting the following information. 7. How is the tongue? 8. How is the smell of the mouth? 9. How is the respiration? 10. How is the hearing? 11. How much are the pupils dilated or constricted? 
How rapidly do they alter in the dark or light? 12. How is the pulse? 13. How is the abdomen? 14. How damp or dry, cold or hot to the touch is the skin in general, or this or that part of it? One might ask, how did Hahnemann determine this information if he did not examine his patients through his own heart and senses and with his own hands? A compassionate touch is not only reassuring to the sufferer, but also provides the homeopath with valuable information. Often a patient states that he or she feels hot and prefers a cool environment. This leads the homeopath to believe he or she is a, quote, hot patient. What if the person's skin is cold to touch, even though the patient says they feel hot? Isn't this important? These symptoms are strange and oddly characteristic and may point to the correct similimum. How can the homeopath elicit this information if they never touch the patient? The Physical Examination John B. Young, who was treated by Hahnemann in Paris in 1837, when he was only 12 years old, gave the following account in the medical advance in April 1893. The boy had been sick for two years and his physicians gave up all hope of his survival. A compassionate wealthy lady brought John to Samuel Hahnemann. He was so exhausted that they travelled in stages so as not to weaken the patient. J. H. Allen carried out the interview at the Herring Medical College of Chicago. This account can be found in the Life and Letters of Dr. Samuel Hahnemann by Bradford. Dr. Allen begins a conversation. You went from London to Paris? Yes, I went from London to Paris. When you arrived in Paris, did you go and see Hahnemann, or did Hahnemann come and see you? He came to see me the second day after my arrival, and gave me an examination that lasted about an hour and a half. Did he strip you? Yes, I had to go to bed. He went over me more thoroughly than I have ever been gone over before or since. Dr. Allen. And still it is said that Hanman was a symptomatologist and usually prescribed for symptoms and rarely made a physical examination. Mr. Young. He would make me count one, two, three, etc. up to 100 and put an instrument to my chest and did the same to my back and he did more thumping of my chest than I ever had before. He said he knew that I had come to him in time and he could cure me. Did he give you very much medicine? Not a great deal. I think I had medicine about four times a day at first, including what I got at night. What was your impression of Hahnemann? The first impression made on my mind when I saw him was that his face had a luminous expression. He looked more to me, as I would call it, a divine man. There was divinity about his appearance. He was a good man, undoubtedly, and I was informed that he often, when he gave his medicine, said to his patients that he was but the instrument, that he did the best he could, and then they must look to God for the blessing." Unquote. This stirring rendition of Hahnemann's presence to a dying young boy whose life he saved is very touching, as was the fact that he did not charge anything for the nine months of treatment. It illustrates that Hahnemann was an expert not only at recording symptoms, but also at the art of clinical examination. A well-trained homeopath will notice signs and symptoms during such an examination that their orthodox counterparts would not. The means used in such an examination may look similar, but the direction that it takes a homeopath is quite different. Kent also was a firm believer that examination of the patient is an integral part of taking a case. He wrote, there is more to be learned about diagnosis and prognosis by studying the complex of symptoms than by any form of physical examination, but both and all methods of investigation should be used as they confirm each other, and often where one is defective, the other is strong and helpful. Unquote. Sometimes it is said by homeopaths that the study of pathology is not necessary Yet Hahnemann's writings represent the most advanced pathological system in medicine. If the homeopath has no idea of what the patient is suffering, how can they find a remedy 
manage the case and advise the patient on their condition. It would be more accurate to say, as Hanneman did, that orthodox pathology, with its lack of integrated symptomatology, rigid metabolic concepts and reductionist disease names, is of no help to the homeopath. It is important to write a complete physical description of the patient, as these general symptoms are important signs. Is the patient tall and thin or short and fat? Are they tight or loose tissue types? Do they have dark or light colouring? Do they seem irritable, calm, hasty, slow, anxious, hopeful or lacrimose? Is the patient's basic constitution choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine or nervous or a mixture of these? How much vitality does the patient seem to have? Are their reactions quick or slow? How sensitive do they seem? Does the patient have the unhealthy, dirty look of Sora or the warts, flecks and moles of psychosis? Does the patient have the reddish, coppery colouring of syphilis or the pale, greyish, white skin and flushed cheeks of Pseudosora? Technically speaking, symptoms are those things stated by the patient and signs are those things observed by the examiner. So that's the end of our reading for this episode of Compendium Talks. Thanks for listening, and remember to look out for our next podcast. See you again soon. Bye-bye.